Hey, it's Warren Coughlin here. Welcome to another episode of the Business That Matter Spotlight. Okay, strap in. I've been looking forward to this conversation. Uh, one of the ideas that we're really trying to communicate in this podcast is the need to develop strong business discipline if you want to have significant impact. And it's like the desire to do good simply isn't enough. You need to have the chops to make it happen. And you need to be able to pragmatically balance the, the desire to do good with the reality you're facing. There's, a, there's an author and personal development guru. Her name is Byron Katie. And she once said that whenever I argue with reality, I lose, but only every time. So that doesn't mean you don't try to change that reality, but you have to start with what's there. And I think today's guest is really a huge exemplar of both of these ideas. Jeff Golfman is a brilliant entrepreneur, able to see an opportunity, seize it, modify it, identify new opportunities, creatively develop solutions, all while remaining committed to a vision and a set of values. Those skills and commitment have driven massive and rapid growth. Jeff is the founder of Send123, previously known as The Raw Office. Jeff, welcome to the spotlight. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for the great introduction. Oh, I'm thrilled to have you here. Okay, I'm sure I've piqued the interest of anybody listening, but before we dive in, if you were, what I always like to do is just give a little bit of advice from the guest right off the top in case someone can't stick through uh, the whole way through the podcast. So if you were to give just one piece of advice to an entrepreneur really wanting to scale up their business and their impact, what would you suggest? I would say focus on the business fundamentals, like product market fit, customer fit, founder, company fit. You got to make sure that you actually have a business here. I think there's a lot of people that have, like, let's say, the, the, the wish or the desire to run a business, and they go after vanity metrics. I don't know mm -hmm. if you want to go into the vanity metrics, but there's a lot of vanity metrics out there. And we often, as entrepreneurs, we find ourselves busy in the busy work, not actually in actually making a difference in your business right. or making a difference in the world. I mean, I, you know, those are two different things. But... So I guess, you know, to boil it down, if I had to have one piece of advice, product market fit. And a second one there would be like, like founder business fit, like not every founder is, is a good fit for that particular business, right? Like mm -hmm. I know that, you know, I wouldn't fit in, in most businesses, but, you know, I think I found my spot. Right. So, okay, normally I, I go backwards, but you just you lit me up a little bit. So those are, we're going to go into the weeds a minute right off the, right the get-go. So first, talk a little bit more about that founder business fit. Like that's not a, that's not a, you always hear product market fit, but founder business fit isn't something a lot of people talk about. So describe that a little bit more. Yeah. And I think, I think it's really rather important, right? Like mm -hmm. I'll, I'll give you, I mean, I could give you a, a crazy example, right? Like, you know, I wouldn't want to be running a dance studio as an example, because like I've got, you know, two left feet, you know, I'm not much of a dancer and I've always been shy about that. Right. So, you know, even if there's a huge opportunity to open up a dance studio or a dance class or an online dance, something I, I'm giving a ridiculous example, but I think it fits mm -hmm. in, in what we're trying to talk about here is you, you, you know, some people say, like, do what you love and everything else will follow. And there, there's there's some truth to that. There's also some hocus pocus to that, too. But there's some truth to that is that you and your business need to fit just like you and your investors. There needs to be founder investor fit. There needs to be product market fit. Like your product that you're putting out in the marketplace has to fit and the customers need to want it. And and and, and so back to you as the entrepreneur you need to fit the business, right? Your skill set has to add value to the business, whether it's in sales and marketing, preferably in sales and marketing, because most businesses fail because they don't have revenue. I know people like to say businesses fail because they run out of money. Yes, they run out of money because they don't have revenue. That's right. why the businesses fail. It's like basically, you know, saying, you know, people die because they stop breathing. Well, that's not why you died. You didn't die because you stopped breathing, right? <laughs> like, but it's, but it's, that's not that's not that's not true i mean i guess it's true but it's not the cause. <laughs> it wasn't it wasn't the previous cause of it yeah it's not the cause I mean, the of only it. wrinkle i would say to what you're saying is and it's you don't necessarily have to be a great dancer to run a dance studio but it needs to connect with your passion like you could be a failed dancer but really love it and feel like oh i can create an environment where other people who are really great get to flourish as long as it's connected to what you're you're sort of passionate about correct yeah. Now, okay, but yes, but it's very, yes, you need to be passionate about what you're doing, but you don't have to be passionate per se 
about the every single aspect of your business, right? Correct. Yes. Right. And point of fact, that if you have that expectation, I think that's going to be a problem. There are things that that's why you have to build teams is bring in the people who have the skill sets and the passions for the things that you don't. Right. Now, and I would say the other the flip side to that is just because you're passionate. So let's get back to the dance example or the yoga studio example, or maybe you're passionate about ice cream and you want to open up an ice cream manufacturer, ice cream distribution or something like that. Just because you're passionate about it doesn't mean it's a good idea. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's where, that's where you need the product market fit. The product that you want to go out to market has to fit. And then also you as the founder has to fit the product and the market that you're going after. So everything has to fit together. Like it's like a jigsaw puzzle. And then you've got your finance piece, whether you're using your own finance or using somebody else's finance, or you've got an investor, there still has to be finance product founder fit. And then there's got to be team. There's got to be team fit, right? Mm -hmm. Like all these pieces have to fit together or you're not going to have a winning combination. Yeah. And I'm so glad we're saying this right out of the get go. Cause I, there's a lot of, I get into trouble sometimes, frankly, because uh, there's a lot of people who do the just follow your bliss um, coaching. God, no. And I'm always railing against that for the very reason that you say, like, you, you, there are some things that are great hobbies, but they're not great businesses. And if your goal is to create a business, what you're saying that product market fit, uh, the opportunity, the finance fit, the right timing, all of that needs to be there as well. Yeah. And yes, and not every idea is a winning idea like not every idea is meant to be a business right or meant to be a scalable business like i think that's the other thing too is that you have to have like when i'm talking about like founder um finance fit or founder investor fit you got to have the right goals right, right. like you might, you might just want to have a hobby business or a hobby farm or 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 a hobby project and your investor might like and that's legit. It's totally legit if that's what your goal is. But if your investor or your finance partner wants you to be going publicly traded on NASDAQ in 24 months, there's going to be a problem. There's going to be friction. And if you're just looking for a weekend project or a night's project or like, and there's there's a lot of people who have amazing small businesses that don't want to scale and don't want to grow. And like, if you look at the stats, I think it's something like, 80 plus percent of businesses are small businesses mm -hmm. and they run the economy and they run the gross domestic product and they, they keep our economy alive and a, as a going concern. So I think it's really important when I talk about this, again, the founder fit and the investor fit or the finance fit, like you all got to be aligned because I think what happens too often right now is we watch these TV shows and we watch, we listen to other podcasts not your podcast, Warren, but we listen to other podcasts where we're meant to believe that we're massive failures if we're not billionaires by next quarter. Yeah. Good. <laughs> yes. Right? Yeah. And that is just ridiculous. Right. Yeah. It'd, be, it'd be like, look, I'm from Canada. It, you know, I played hockey when I grew up and I, I, you know, I was good at it until puberty hit and everybody got bigger, faster and stronger. I was still skilled, but I, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't compete as much, right? Am I a failure because I didn't make it as a professional hockey player and I'm not like playing in the National Hockey League? Does that make me a failure? Like not everybody that picks up a hockey stick, not everybody that picks up a guitar can have a number one bestseller on the Billboard Top 20 or whatever it is, right? Yeah. Not everybody can be publicly traded and become a billionaire. Like that's just not realistic. And I, I find that in today's society with the way social media is today and the way that that these TV shows and look, I love the TV. I love them all. I mean, I've watched I, I watched all of Succession and all of Billions. And, you know, <laughs> I, I, I love those shows like they're fun, but they're not reality based for ninety nine point nine percent of the founders and the businesses that are out there. Like, it's just it's just not how it is. Right. Yeah. Like, so you and, mentioned the one other thing in the weeds. You, you talked about vanity metrics. Uh, yeah. I'd like to just knock those off off the top because that's that's again another one of my pet peeves uh, is when people are just measuring the wrong things to sort of puff themselves up, but it doesn't actually make any difference for their business, their life, all of that. Correct. So yeah, so you want to know what some of those are? The vanity yeah. Metrics? Yeah. So 
um, how many meetings do you have scheduled and how many presentations are you making and how many airplane rides are you taking and how many people did you talk to and how many, you know, how big is your pipeline? This is what people love to say. Oh yeah, I've got $10 billion in my pipeline or my addressable market is $20 billion. Yeah. Good for you. Congratulations. Like take that to the bank and see how far that gets you. Right. Like it doesn't matter how big your pipeline is. It doesn't matter how big your addressable market is. It doesn't matter how many meetings you went to. It doesn't matter how many people you talk to. What matters is closing. Did you close the deals? Did you get the revenue? Are you turning the turnstile? Yeah. Are you making margin? Oh, yeah, that's another one. Okay. Revenue by itself only tells part of the story. What about margin? Yep. You making margin. Oh, revenue, revenue is vanity and profit is sanity. Yeah, I like that. Revenue is vanity, profit is sanity. Yes, except for that the precursor to the margin and the profit is the revenue. 100%. And, but, and if that's all, but there's people who are always bragging about, like, I passed 1 million, I passed 10 million. I've seen people who've got, I had a client, you know, doing 20 million in revenue with a profit that was maybe 500,000. You kind of think, well, okay. <laughs> That's fine, but it's not, you know, it doesn't really measure up to 20 million in revenue. In terms yeah. of, it puffs you up a lot, but it isn't necessarily what the, it's not the big outcome that you're thinking. You're not going to get a five time multiple off your 20 million in revenue if you're only generating 500,000 in profit. Yeah. What's that? Two and a half percent or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of small. You know, it's interesting. It reminds me of a time many years ago. Um, my grandfather was entrepreneur, my father entrepreneur, all my uncles entrepreneurs. And um, I was helping out the family business and they sent me on a trip to Denmark to go meet with this um, this factory that was, they were doing like $50 million a year with uh, Ikea. They were selling like futons and beds to Ikea, doing $50 million a year. And I went and met with them, went to the factory, tried to learn what they were doing, tried to learn all the stuff. And he said to me, he said, you know, Jeff, um, we fired Ikea as a customer and it just like frazzled my brain. I was like, what are you talking about? Like Ikea or you've got, if you got Ikea, you got Walmart, you got Costco. It's like, you've hit, like you've hit the jackpot. You've hit Nirvana, right? That's what I had always thought. You know, I went to business school and that's what they taught us. And you go and you do business with these big guys and you, you, you like, you've hit the jackpot. Right. And what he explained to me is after they stopped working with Ikea, yes, their revenue went down, but they stopped working seven days a week. He was at home with his family for the weekends. His margin went up. His profit went up. He actually was able to know all the employees in his company by name. And it was a better quality of life for him all the way around. And I've never forgotten that. And it just really... Like for most people, like to me, that just blew my mind. Like, what do you mean? You're doing $50 million a year and you said goodbye to Ikea. You don't want to work with them anymore. I mean, that that's just mind boggling. But when you yeah. think about it, it's like well, your profit system. is higher. Profit is higher. You have fewer people you have to manage, fewer headaches, fewer systems, and you're taking home more money. It's a better deal. Right. Less returns, less refunds, less customer service, less problems, less headaches less financing at the bank, all that stuff, right? And so I think that's like, to me, that's the perfect example of the vanity metrics or, you know, like like you can get on that treadmill, but it's not actually going to improve your quality of life. It's not going to improve your business. It's going to improve your metrics. Now, there are some exceptions to that. And I can hear, I can hear the haters hating already on what I just said. There are some exceptions on that, is that if you are going to go down the road that the Silicon Valley growth path is, you can go there. Again, that's like less than 1%. It's less than 10% of 1%. Like it's one-tenth of 1% of the businesses can go down the Silicon Valley path to publicly traded status, and they can trade off of their revenue, and they can go public, even though they've never become profitable. Like an Amazon, a WeWork, a Uber, um, you know, like there's a very few businesses that can actually go down that path and play the revenue game and figure out the profitability later. Mm -hmm. If you're playing that game, you know, you can do that. Now, just keep in mind, there's a lot of roadkill that have tried that and yep. have died as a result of that. 
because and it's and that's one of those things that happens with every cycle. I I re- I'm an old fart, you know. So back in the late '90s, everybody was doing that with the web game. People were just investing in web businesses, and then we hit the we hit the dot bust, right? Because everybody was doing it off the share value and the doing the stock play, even though there were no there were no sustainable business models. That's right. And it was yeah, it was, it was bad. Yeah. Let's, let's let's actually shift back to you. We got off on a fun tangent there, but I hope there's value for people in that. Measure the right things and make sure your business actually solves a problem, that there's a fit out there and you've got the right mix with your goals and the people who are supporting you. Um, but your your business is you're like you're like that meme, right? This is how it started, this is how it's going. Because your your business has gone through some huge changes. So let's actually start with right now and then go back. Um, so your business does a lot of things, but how would you describe in, you know, reader's digest version, sort of what you do and who you do it for? Yeah, thank you. We, there's three, three things that we do. We help businesses find the products that they need to buy sourcing. We help businesses pay for the products that they need to buy, which is order financing. And then we help businesses market the products that they've bought, which is e-commerce technology. So it's kind of like, so in, in, in a holistic sense, we're in supply chain management mm-hmm. and supply chain uh, financing, and we're focused on B2B e-commerce, right? So we're in yeah. the B2B e-commerce space. We're helping businesses source the products they need to buy, pay for the products they want to finance, and then market the products and get them to market those same products. And when, when it's businesses, like what kinds of businesses and what size are you? So small businesses, is it Fortune 500s, all of the above? Well, it's all of the above. But but your question is a very, a very good question. In the, in the um, three buckets of revenue, there's different, like the, the, the Fortune 500s aren't necessarily doing order financing with us because typically they've already got their own finance set up and they got their own banking arrangements and they can, they can do that stuff. But um, so on the order finance piece, it's typically small to medium sized business. Um, Let's say a business gets an order for something. Um, I can give you some examples, whether it's we've had recently, we've had clothing, we've had blankets, we've had um, one guy who financed bowling alleys with us. He ordered a bunch of bowling alleys. Um, We've, we've done, um, I'm just trying to think of all the things we've done construction supplies. We've done uh, food and beverage supplies. Like we've done like the whole gamut of stuff. Um, um, inventory purchasing also done um, just, I, I don't know. There's hundreds of different things that we financed. And so, so those are usually small to medium sized business. They want to buy something. They don't have the funds to put up, to put down a deposit at a factory or put up hundred percent prepay on some items that are on the ground that they're buying. So we put up the money, we finance it, we quality control it, we do shipping logistics, last mile delivery, and then we get paid later. Uh, we get paid later after they have turned that uh, product into revenue. Uh, so, and, and I guess it's the question- actually not just supply chain, it sounds like you're you're kind of in a de-risking business, like you're, you're massively de-risking their operations. Yes, sir, yeah. Exactly. Because we do quality control, shipping logistics, make sure that it's the paperwork is done properly. You know, there's a lot of entrepreneurs that are hustling and and, and just moving so fast that they don't slow down for, you know, those little things like paperwork and quality control and, you know, making sure things are done right. Right. And, and I can tell you, I am in one of those entrepreneurs myself, right? Like I'm just, I don't want to be bothered with all that little stuff, but I know how important it is. So I put a team around me to help with the compliance issues and the paperwork and the, you know, those kind of things, right? Like filling out custom forms and shipping papers and, you know, that just, that stuff drives me bonkers. And I'm sure a lot of your listeners are the same way. Like I've heard it from a lot of entrepreneurs. Like they think that, you know, that that's just getting in the way of things and it's so trivial and stupid. And it's like, well, sure. You might think of that until you don't get paid or the product doesn't arrive and right. now you've got a lawsuit on your hands and then that trivial little stupid thing doesn't seem so stupid anymore, does it? Oh, that happened so much during COVID. I had clients who 
their whole operations. It was very interesting, right? Like pre-COVID, everything was about cost reduction, cost minimization, offshore all your supplies because we can reduce our cost. And all of a sudden, supply chain reliability became a bigger issue. And it was suddenly, you know what? We can incur a few higher costs if we can ensure our supply chain. Because not Correct. being able to deliver anything to our customers is kind of a problem for our growth. Yeah, like the single source just-in-time um, business model. And I've been talking about this for years. I mean, you know, when I went to business school, you know, we heard about the just-in-time business model, how amazing it is. And and it is until there's a global pandemic or there's a supply chain disruption or there's a war in the Middle East and all the shipping lanes are shut down. You know, then your single source just-in-time doesn't look so smart anymore, does it, right? And people might not remember, but there was a time not too many years ago where we didn't have toilet paper to go to the bathroom, right? And how does does your single source look then? And so I've been talking about this for years with what we're doing with Send123 on the sourcing side is single sourcing is a bad strategy. You should always have a backup plan and we can be that backup plan for you even if it's 10, 20% of your supply chain, if something goes wrong, you got somebody sitting there that can help you out. And and so, and that's how we've been able to be successful with some of the Fortune 500s, right? Is that they are giving us a piece, a piece of the supply chain as opposed to the entire supply chain. And, and we've got some great customers that we're doing that for. Now that isn't how it began though, right? Like how, where, where, did, where did the business start? Because it started in much more humble origins, as many businesses do. Where it started, in my original, so I used to be a supplier to Staples, Office Depot, Office Max. Um, I was a supplier to them. And I got to learn about the supply side and all the the pain and the challenges and the opportunities inside a supply chain and sourcing and also in, you know, um, supplies for businesses. And, and in that I, I saw an opportunity for us to come in and help businesses uh, do better. And my original hypothesis was a much smaller hypothesis. It was going to be a simple business of doing remanufactured ink and toner for businesses and become a supplier for businesses on that. Because a lot of businesses spend a lot of money on ink and toner, and ink and toner is very expensive, and it also happens to be a high margin product. And that was my original hypothesis. And I set up a website and we went on sale with, I think, 3,000 different ink and toners that were remanufactured and eco-friendly and all this kind of stuff. And it was going to save everybody a bunch of money. And that was the original hypothesis. And, and you know, we're a million miles away from that original concept. And why? Well, we still sell ink and toner. We still have those 3,000 products that we still sell. But today we have 180,000 products on our website that we're selling. And our sourcing sourcing capabilities goes wide to probably 5 million products that we could source uh, for businesses today, uh, if not more than 5 million. And the reason being is what we learned from the original hypothesis is that um, we had no customers on that hypothesis because businesses Uh, What we learned is that businesses want a single source. They want a one-stop shop. They want to be able to buy more than just one great product. Like even though our products are great on that one product, they wanted everything in the basket available on one one, uh, platform. And so now we can go single source for a business or we could be a piece of that business. Like I just talked a few minutes ago, we can do a net 30 days or 60, 90 days based on, on order financing. We can also have all this great technology that we, we haven't talked about, but we've built out all this amazing technology that businesses now want to you know, license our technology where we can have manager approvals and we can have order approvals and we can have all this great transparency on your carbon footprint or your made in America footprint or how many products are made locally versus overseas or um, what kind of visibility we can give into people's businesses where you could see every location in the business, what they're buying and what they're spending and how much they're spending and how much eco-friendliness they're doing and not doing and offshore buying and all those kind of things. So we built this great technology that gives great visibility. And now people are licensing that software from us. And now people are buying from us and it's all carbon neutral and it's eco-friendly. And 
uh, sorry, let me just rephrase. When I say it's carbon neutral, our supply chain is carbon neutral. And anybody that works with us is now doing carbon neutral on the products that they buy from us. And then on the eco-friendly, we allow people to buy as much eco-friendly as they want or as little as they want. So the original concept was it's going to be 100% eco-friendly, found out there was no customers. So what we really discovered is people want choice. Mm -hmm. People want the ability to choose how eco-friendly do I want to be or do I want to be buying local or do I want to be buying offshore? Do I want to be recycled content or no recycled content? And so our technology now gives people the choice of doing that and you get to figure out what are the values for you and your business. And then we can meet you on those values, lock it in on our technology, and then deliver it to you in a way that nobody else can. And that's where we've discovered we have our product market fit, where we're adding value, where we're growing. Um, in the last 15, uh, sorry, in the last five quarters, uh, 15 months, in the last 15 months, we're up. 275% on revenue over the last five quarters. And we see that continuing, like over the next five or, uh, quarters, we see that growth rate continue to, to continue. Nice. Now that's, yeah. um, I, I'm glad you got there because that's something I wanted to get to because the, you know, the first part of our conversation was almost like, well, the value of Send123 is just sort of, you know, a broad platform or product choice. But it really is about that ability to control and it's the transparency and the, the ability to navigate your own desire to move up these value chains. And that's one of the things you and I talked about previously. One of the one of the problems is a lot of purity testing. Some people Some people just can't go fully eco, either because there's technical problems within their business so they don't have the cash flow to sustain higher price products or whatever whatever it might be but they're dipping their toe in and they're growing they're growing their commitment to that after experimenting with it a little bit and the fact that you're able to to track gives them some reporting opportunities as well right yeah absolutely like we give full transparency like how we've been able to differentiate ourselves from a staples or a uline or a costco walmart amazon is you get full visibility you get tracking, you get reporting, you get carbon neutrality, and you get to lock it to be exactly the way you want it to be, right? Like we put together what we call a curated program for you and your business. So let's say your business. So what we're finding, we talked about people like choice. We have 180,000 products on our tech right now. We can source probably 5 million different products. If you go on to a Staples, they might have a million products and Amazon might have 20, 30 million products. And Alibaba might have 30 million or a billion products. They might have like hundreds of millions of, who knows? I don't know the exact number, but a Staples is probably around a million. Uh, Amazon's probably 20 or 30 million and Alibaba might be a hundred million products, let's say. People want the illusion of the choice. They actually don't want choice. And I can give you some personal examples. You go into the grocery store. Most of us buy the same bananas, the same apples, the same grapes, the same meat, the same fish, the same legumes, vegetable, the same everything. Every week you buy virtually the same. Maybe you tweak five or 10%, maybe, but over the course of the year, it's the same. You look this year, last year, you're buying the same, this, the same. The same thing happens in our businesses. We want the same products over and over again. We look at our clothing, you look at your food choices, you look at your, like the things you buy for fun or hobbies or dessert or whatever, it's the same. You're buying the same things over and over. We're creatures of habit. And even though we have 180,000 products on our website, I think I asked you this before, how many products do you think we actually sold in the last 12 months, right? I can't remember the answer now. Yeah, but it's like 500 something. Like there's 180,000 products. People want the choice. They think they want the Amazon or the eBay, the Alibaba for the, the, the gazillion SKUs that they have. I don't have the exact numbers, so don't quote me. But um, in reality, across all the businesses that we're supplying, it was like 500 and something different products that people actually are buying and actually need, right? right. And so when you think about that from an efficiency perspective, perspective in your business, right? If we get back to the just-in-time conversation from a few minutes ago, one of the just-in-time principles is to simplify 
your supply chain and your purchasing. So you're buying only the products that you need and they're readily available and, and all that kind of stuff. Well, you don't need the millions of products. You only need the 500 products. And most businesses that we're finding, we can run them on 80 to 100 different products to run their businesses. And I'm not talking about the inputs for the manufacturing. That's different. Manufacturing inputs is different. I'm talking about the actual business products to run the business. The right. products you need in the bathroom and the reception and in the warehouse and in the boardroom and in the executive suites. It's about 80 to 100 different products. Right. That's, that's about it. Right. And the ability, the reporting thing is really, I was actually just speaking to somebody yesterday who's heavily involved in um, like larger organizations and their uh, reporting requirements now. And like a lot of banks in order to advance financing are requiring businesses to be able to demonstrate their ecological compliance um, and a whole bunch of other metrics around that kind of stuff. Um, and it's it's becoming a big deal. Some people aren't even allowed to be suppliers of certain institutions if they can't demonstrate, you know, the zero net put or, or path towards net zero or things like that. So yeah. virtual, it's not only just a feel good that I'm able to track this stuff, but it yeah. actually it actually helps people run their businesses more effectively and sell to customers. Hundred percent, hundred percent. There are certain businesses that won't sell to you. Sorry, won't sell buy from you. Buy from you. Sorry, they won't buy from you if you don't. You can't prove that. And there's third party certifications that you have to have, or there's third party metrics you have to have. And so, with our technology, we're 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 proving that for people. Like, how much recycled content do you have? How much made locally do you have? How much uh, we're offsetting the carbon so it's carbon neutral, and you can do all those things. And you can use that in your reporting, whether it's your, like you say, your 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 sales and marketing reporting or your business reporting or your all that stuff. So um, I believe that's the future, right? And I don't think that um, a lot of businesses are focused on that, but these are the kind of things that you can get for, you know, very little extra effort, very little extra money. Right now, where and, does that come from for you? Because part of it, like we we've, we've been speaking largely in really hardcore business terms, but I know from our earlier conversation, you actually have some personal passion around this, around you know the eco and making things better and making the world a better place. Like, where does that come from for you, and how important has that been into the design of this business? Yeah, well, I I mean, I guess for me, it's always come down from a belief that I can make a difference in the world. And maybe that's just my my human complex that I believe that we all should make a difference in the world. We should all like to me, it's always from a younger age. I've always felt that, like, what's the point? Like, what's the point in doing anything if we're not going to make a difference? If we're not going to like, I, I, you know, like they could say, like, um, what's what's that that saying? Like, make your life a mission, not an intermission. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like I've always felt like that's what we should all be doing is trying to make a difference and trying to like leave this planet a little bit better off than it was when we, when we got here. Um, for me, it started at a very young age. Um, it, it really, I, like from a very young age, I always thought that I could make a difference and I wanted to make a difference. I wanted to be different and unique. And I thought the way to do that would be to, you know, Try to be, try to see if I can make a difference through the businesses that I was creating. Like I didn't want to just, like when I went to business school, I saw a lot of my colleagues and my, you know, like a lot of my my um, like the people in my class. They went to Wall Street and they went to Bay Street and they went down the money path or they went down the the consulting path. And to me, I I, I thought that through in- entrepreneurship. Like we didn't have the language for it then, but I thought through entrepreneurship, we can make a difference, right? And now today we say, well, you know, as a B Corp, uh, we're registered B Corp and certified B Corp, you know, business as a force for good, right? We mm-hmm. didn't have the language back then. We didn't have the language, um, you know, like you used to call it sustainable development is is what the, you know, the buzzwords of the day were. Could you do business, but also do good at the same time? They used to call that sustainable development. Today, now it's a triple bottom line or it's, you know, yeah. ESG or whatever, whatever the buzzword of the day is, it seems to change every five or 10 years. Um, but it's all saying the same thing. Like, can you make a difference, a positive difference 
while you're making commerce at the same time. And it, it, it always, you know, I don't know. So I think, I think more specifically, my very first business uh, that I started in this regard, my first business was I was cleaning swimming pools, you know, as a teenager, right. I was a teenager, I swim, clean swimming pools and, you know, started uh, making revenue and, you know, and we would charge people to clean the pools. Right. And we were teenagers driving around outside in the summertime in shorts and a t-shirt all summer. It was great. It was a great business. The margins were good and and the pay was good. And, and in hindsight, it was probably my, my favorite business I had. Uh, but you know, it, it seemed just too small for me. It seemed too trivial for me. And then I went to business school and coming out of business school, I started a recycling company and I thought, okay, how can I make money and do good? I said, okay, let's do recycling. And I started Canada's first user pay curbside recycling program, um, blue box program. And I started that back, you know, that was 1991 when I started that. And it, it was my way of thinking, can we do good, but also make money? Could it be big business, but do good? That was really the concept because I didn't want to do small. I thought like, if I'm going to do something, I'm going to do big. Like, what's the point? It's the same amount of effort. It's the same amount of energy. Like, it's the same as well go big. And so then how much, so when you designed this business, did this sort of the eco side of it, was it um, a response to demand or was it a consciously designed element uh, of the business from early on? I would say it was both. Um for me, like since that day back in 91, I've always had some eco uh, eco venture that I've been in, right? Um, after the recycling, um, I went in, I, I, we had vented some paper that was made from uh, wheat and hemp and straw and stuff like that. It was tree-free paper that doesn't cut down trees. And then I started a furniture uh, business that was locally made and sustainable sustainable materials and recycled materials and local materials and things like that. And then started this business to be the remanufactured ink and toners. And then it grew from there to be uh, carbon neutral uh, supplies and pushing people towards the local as much as possible. You know, we're quite proud of the fact that almost half of the products we sell are made locally versus overseas, right? Like if you, if you talked about business supplies and you asked most people, they would think it would be 80, 90% made offshore, but we're, we're, you know, more than almost half of it, I think almost half of it is made locally. So, you know, so for me, it's always been baked into what I do because it's how, um, it's kind of wired that way. I kind of wired that way. And, 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 you know, I think a lot of people, they go into these eco-friendly businesses and they, they try to come off as, um, you know, they're better than everybody else or they're, you know, holier than thou, right? And all this kind of stuff. And, you know, if I'm being completely honest, it 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 makes me feel good to do good, right? right? And so if I'm feeling good by trying to do good, at the same time, I'm trying to go big. At the same time, I'm trying to add value to the customers, but also like to the people that are involved in the business, I want them to have an exit and a profit from it. So, it's kind of it's win win win. It's like like if we can if we can do people, planet, and profit, triple bottom line, everybody wins. Absolutely. On that, I do want to I want to talk about your financing bit a little bit, part for a very specific reason. I think it's a really great example of somebody who sees a problem, a hole in the market, and uses it to solve everybody's problem. Because in the absence of that finance, you're talking about small, medium-sized businesses who don't have access to, I mean, because I think you described like, there aren't a lot of credit facilities for purchasing of these kind of materials that are needed in growth, right? Correct. Right, yeah. and so then people are, their own growth then is constrained by their ability to self-finance it. And that would then mean your ability to grow is limited because if they're not growing, they're not buying more stuff from you, right? right. So then well, you came up with an answer to that problem. Yeah. So you so just describe how that came about. Like, I think it's just a great example of filling a hole in the market that satisfies a lot of needs. Yeah, I agree with you. I think the way it started is that we were sourcing products for, for companies the company, and it, it actually came out of the pandemic. This this uh, purchase order finance piece that we started was born out of the pandemic. Like we ourselves literally, because we're in sourcing, we got over a billion dollars of purchase orders during the pandemic. A billion with a B. 
Hmm. And we couldn't supply them because A, we didn't have the supply chain set up to do that kind of volume. And B, we didn't have the financing set up to finance that kind of volume. And it fell down. Uh, now, we ended up doing a lot of, you know, our business actually grew during the pandemic because we we're doing supply chain and everybody else's supply chain fell down and there was no toilet paper and no hand sanitizer and, you know, the rest of the story. And we were able to grow because we were supplying people during that 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 time. We were... Um, uh, what's it called? We were like a, an essential business. We were a level one essential business and we had to stay open and support everybody. And we, you know, I, I feel grateful that we were able to do that for people. But what, what 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 came out of that is a lot of businesses like us had orders and couldn't pay for those orders, right? Like maybe they got an order from a Fortune 500 company who pays in 90 days mm -hmm. and they got to pay for the supplies, but they can't afford to pay up front and wait the 90 days. Or they got an order from, you know, the governments, or they got an order from the military, or they got an order from, you know, some very exciting Silicon Valley company. And all of those businesses and all those governments I just described are going to pay you after you deliver. They're not going to prepay you, especially if you're a smaller, medium-sized business. They're going to pay you after you deliver, right? And so maybe you don't have the 30%, 50% deposit to put down at the factory and then pay the boat for it to cross the water and then to get delivered to the customer and then wait the 30 days for them to pay you. And so that's why we started um, Send123 Finance, which is purchase order finance, where we're coming in and helping businesses do that. And then we step in um, with the, 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 the companies have to get credit approved with us. And then they give us a purchase order. And then we give a purchase order to the supplier. We pay the supplier. And then, like we talked about earlier, we'll do the shipping, logistics, quality control if they want us to. If they don't want us to, we don't have to. But that's a value add that we add where we do the shipping and the logistics and the quality control. And then we um, we pay the factory or the supplier or the, you know, whoever it is that's doing the, the supply. We wait to get paid and we get paid later. Mm -hmm. And you don't do it on an interest basis, right? It's a It's a fee for service model. Yeah, we're not a bank, so we're not charging interest. We're 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 take a markup for our services to do that and you know, helping the businesses grow that way. And and there's a lot of there's a lot of businesses that we've been helping, mainly because, like you said earlier, like if it's a short-term order, right? Let's say you get a purchase order from a customer, you don't want to use long-term money to pay for a short-term revenue, right? right. Yeah. Like it makes no sense to sell equity to finance an order. It makes no sense to go to the bank and get a term loan for a five-year loan to finance an order that you just got from from a customer. Like that, that's you're you're upside down with that logic on that financing. But most entrepreneurs, and I was there many, many times myself, you're forced into those kind of situations. Like you're you're diluting you're diluting your company with equity because you can't pay for the orders that you received. And so now you've given away a piece of your business. And, you know, you know, this thing, this, th this drives me nuts with most entrepreneurs. They think that equity is free. Oh, yeah. I'm just going to, I'm just going to sell equity to finance my business. And, and they think it's free. Oh, it didn't cost me any money. I'm just going to sell off some equity. Well, I got news for you. And, and this might become as a shock to people, but equity is the most expensive form of financing if you plan on being successful. If you plan on being successful in your business, equity is the most expensive form of financing. And the converse is true. If you plan on failing, debt is the most expensive. But if you plan on succeeding, debt is the cheapest. Right. And most entrepreneurs, because of those TV shows, uh, you know, I didn't mention like Shark Tank and, and um, Dragon's, um, Den. Dragon's Den and those kind of shows. I didn't mention those shows, but those kind of shows have got this whole paradigm reversed and upside down um, because they're teaching everybody that equity is the way to go. And if you're not growing and if you're not publicly traded in the next few months and you're not a billionaire in the next few weeks, that you're a failure. And they're, they're, they're pushing, I believe, like 99% of businesses don't get venture capital and don't go public, like 99% of them. So therefore, you have to have solutions for the other 99%. And we yeah. as entrepreneurs can't be judging ourselves against those people 
you know, like we talked earlier about, you know, not everybody can become a Billboard top 10 singer. Not everybody can pick up a hockey stick and make it to the NHL. And not every entrepreneur can be publicly traded and venture backed. And nor should they. And it's interesting you say that I was, uh, I've been a mentor at a few different incubators. Um, and it's actually, I introduced some things to a couple of incubators because I was observing that they were so focused on making the business investment ready and their deck investment ready, but they weren't sales ready. And so I, I actually introduced a lot of sales methodology into the incubators for that reason, because you're going to, it's going to be easier for the investor to invest and you're going to have to give up less if you actually have a sales, have a sales success. Yeah. Well, here's a novel concept. How about you focus on profitability? Right. But you go into all of these accelerators and incubators and all of these VCs and all of these TV shows and all this kind of mentorship stuff. And everybody's talking about grow, 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 build, you know, like grow fast and break things and all that kind of stuff. I get it. But you got to have the business fundamentals as well. Mm -hmm. You do have profitability and you do have revenue growth. You may not need as many investors and you can retain more of more ownership of your business. And if it does succeed, then yeah, you're not giving up 30%. You're keeping that money for yourself and right. for, for, for further growth. Yeah. Like if I think back on my high school, when I was in high school, like, you know, like we're, again, I'm Canadian. Almost every high school has like one person that makes it in professional, professional hockey. Right. But that's one person in the entire high school. If you think back in the high school, maybe one person, you know, became a famous singer or maybe one person became like, like some rich, successful, you know, Fortune 500 or something, right? You're talking to like one out of everybody you've ever met yeah. growing up, such a small percentage, right? So for everybody else, us included, let's focus on the fundamentals. Let's focus on... Like you talked about product market fit. In our case, we found out there was a huge gap in order financing, supply chain logistics, transparency, technology that gives full transparency, but also gives control, right? Like on that technology that we've created, like unless you're going to pay Ariba or SAP a million dollars to put in some huge enterprise planning software into your company, which most businesses won't do then you're not going to get the level of transparency and controls that we're offering on our software. So we try to democratize and bring it down for the average business that you can have controls and, and visibility and insights, right? So in each of these areas, we found like, where are the, where are the niches? Where are the gaps? How do we fulfill those gaps? And then I think there's one thing to think about is that, okay, why do we have three different product lines? It's actually one product line which is business supply, right? Just three different revenue buckets inside that product supply. Um, for yeah, business. Three, three problems that interfere with that ability to uh, attain that outcome. That's right. And yeah. not all of our customers take all three. Some do, most don't. Most take one or two of them. Now let's, let's shift a little bit because there's, you and I had an interesting conversation before. Like one of the reasons I really liked I was excited to have you on is because you've, you're very proactive, like you do solve problems um, and you're very much about taking action. And one of the, one of the themes that's come up on this podcast is something I alluded to earlier about the sort of purity testing and that people, you know, either themselves or the cus the market that they're facing demands, or they feel demanded that they can't make that everything has to be lined up. Every ecological thing has to be in place. Every ESG thing has to be in place. And if it's not fully there, then somehow they're not, um, they're being hypocritical. Whereas I've been trying to advocate that it's, you got to grow into these things. You know, it's, it's, if you can jump fully into that wonderful, but most businesses can't. And so stepping your way into it and evolving to get more and more on your path to net zero and high ESG and all of that is wonderful, but give yourself some grace in being able to get there. And, you know, you and I had a bit of a conversation that, it, and it's a frustration that a lot of businesses are, or a lot of people, not even just businesses, there's a lot of talk, but not enough action. Yeah. And so what's, what's your take on that? Well, my, my take is that most people talk but don't walk the walk most people and and you can go to all the conferences you like and you can go to all the 
websites and seminars and webinars and meetups and all that stuff. Most people uh, talk and don't walk the walk. Most people. And I've seen that over the decades. Um, I've seen that in all the different facets of things I've, I've worked in. And, and what, what, I, what I would say is you don't need perfection, right? Like if you look at us on a scale, good, better, best, good, better, best, right? So let's start with good. And then let's move to better. And then maybe eventually you'll get to best. But like, for instance, like, you know, we're a certified B Corp. And most, I think, I think Dr. Bronner's, I don't know if you know them, the soap company, Dr. Bronner's soap, they're, they're, I think they're the highest ranked B Corp in terms of their, their, um, their score. I think their score is something like 150 something. It's almost unheard of that they've got this score. They're like, the, the highest score in a B Corp is 200. It's a theoretical score that you can have as a theoretical. And I think the highest of all the 5,000 businesses that are B Corps around the world, Dr. Bronner's, actually here, I've got one of their products right here. I've got their hand sanitizer right here. That, oh, yeah. uh, so they make amazing products. They've got the highest score. I don't know if they still do. Last time I checked, they had the highest. So correct me if I'm wrong, if they're no longer the highest, but they're the standard. And their standard is not perfection, 200. They're like 150 something or 160 something is their score, right? So even the highest business that is inside of that. Now, most businesses on the scale of the scale of uh, B Corps achieve a score about 50 out of 200. In order to be certified as a B Corp, you need to be over 80, right? So most businesses can't certify because they don't hit the 80. And then the B Corps, that are at the top of the B Corp spectrum are somewhere around 100 to 130. And there's a very few, maybe a handful that are like 140 to 160, like Dr. Bronner's and, and a few others, like a very few others that actually ever get there. And I think Bronner's has been around for decades. It's not like they started at the top mm -hmm. of the, of, like, like, so, so my, my feeling is you got to walk, before you run, you go big, good, better, best. And I, I, like you said, the purity testing, I think it's complete nonsense that I think today they are calling it woke and people on the wokeness who are just like out there, if you're not perfect, then you're no good and you don't exist as a human being and you should be canceled because you're not perfect. And yet nobody is perfect and no business is perfect. And I've never seen a perfect business. Like like I just said, the highest scoring B Corp in the world doesn't have a perfect score. Right. It, it doesn't exist. Right. I have a little bit of a different take on the woke thing. I try not to get too, because I, I think that word has become co-opted by a lot of different people in a lot of different ways. Um, and it's unfortunate. Like when it first emerged, it was really just be awake to the compassion and needs of other human beings, which is not a, should not be a particularly controversial concept, you know, no. But then it's been it's been co-opted in unfortunate ways on all sides of the spectrum. But um, but the point that you have to you have to attain some standard in order to be seen as acceptable um, is problem. Now, the one thing I just to go a level deeper, um, and this may be even more controversial, it's it's also easy to rationalize. Right. It's easy to to sort of say, oh, well, someday I'll get there as a justification for doing crappy things now. You know, like there are some there are some businesses that frankly maybe shouldn't exist if you actually really care about the future of the planet. Um and there's yeah. a bit of a balance there, right? Like if you're just if you're doing something really crappy and it's sort of like, well, someday I'm sure there's going to be some technology that's going to come along and make this a little bit better, so I'll invest in that then while doing something really crappy right now. That may not really fully align. And then yeah. there's so there's this, it's always on a spectrum. And I, I find the conversations that are so binary that you're either, you're either with us or you're against us, or you're either fully a, an ecologically ESG business or you're on the dark side. That, that analysis is just too simplistic and too binary that doesn't allow for growth of, of even consciousness. You know, because some people, they, I've known people, they want to do good, but it's like you said, like, I, I, I don't know how. Like I wanted, but I don't know what my options are. You know, I had somebody on the podcast who had to make a choice between local or organic because there was nobody local who was organic. Yeah. So what, do, what do I do in that case? Right. Well, 100%. And I guess what I'm talking about, 
Yeah, what's happened is it's it's morphed into cancel culture, where if you aren't perfect, you're canceled, right? And I know right now with social media, like I think it's, I don't go there anymore. I, I just don't do it anymore. And because if I posted something, you're going to get people hating, you're going to get people loving, you're going to get people fighting about what I've done or what I've said. Or even like, even for, if I just said, hey, there's Dr. Bronner's, I just plugged them on this show. People might be hating on me for plugging Dr. Bronner's and maybe they're like, oh, they're not perfect or they do this or they do that or whatever. Like guys, like these guys are making handmade products that's organic. They're a certified B Corp. They're locally made. Like they're trying, they're trying to do so many things. Like, can't we just, can't we just applaud and congratulate the efforts that people are making and say, like good for trying, like, like you don't need to be a hundred percent perfect in order to just get out of the, get out of the gate. Like right. you don't need to be perfect on everything that we're doing. And I think that that's where society has gotten to right now, where it's got to the point where an example, right? So a number of years ago, I started, um, I started a, um, uh, a video blog called the cool vegetarian. And, um, and we, we, I've put up over 300 videos. It's a video blog. And I've, I've basically what I do, I went around and I interviewed doctors and experts and um, athletes and famous people and Olympians and, and business people and all about how to be healthier and how to be, how to live a healthier lifestyle. Now I intentionally called it vegetarian intentionally, even though all the content that I put in there was vegan. All the content was vegan, but I called it vegetarian. Why? To cast a wider net, to be more inclusive, and to, to invite more people into the conversation. Mm -hmm. If I called it the vegan, the cool vegan, like it would have just totally have narrowed the people. And now right. I think we've got over 20 million views, and I think there's over 20,000 subscribers, and like it's become very popular and and it's because we we made it more inclusive and open right i think you I got criticized for that as well oh i absolutely got criticized for oh you're vegetarian oh you're not perfect you're not pure what are you doing killing animals why are you this that and the other thing it's like whoa 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 like i'm not killing animals i'm not doing anything i'm giving i'm interviewing experts on content and it's actually all vegan content, but I'm just casting a wider net, right? Like if I called it, if I called it the perfection, nobody makes a mistake ever. Everything is amazing, organic, local, macrobiotic. You know, nobody ever dies because you live forever podcast. Who's going to listen? Yeah. Nobody. Right. And part of that, part of that is, which is, it's the invitation. And that's, that's kind of what I'm trying to do with this podcast is like invite people to the table about how to do it. Like you don't, you, you don't have to be perfect before you put down your first dollar, have the goal, have the objective to get better, be committed to your values, be committed to making a difference and then keep discovering just as you did, right? Like you discovered, you didn't start off with the financing arm of your business that became a very valuable opportunity, but it emerged through the effort of trying to help people. Yeah. And to put it into like a real, you know, bring it back to a business context, the Silicon Valley model of uh, minimal viable product and rushing to a sprint and doing weekly sprints or monthly sprints and just put out a minimal viable product. It's not searching for perfection, right? Like that's mm -hmm. how the Silicon Valley model has been able to grow and build and go is that you don't put out a perfect product. In fact, you put out an inferior product, you get feedback, you iterate on that feedback, you improve upon it, and you're constantly improving, improving, improving. And you build in a feedback loop of customer feedback. And to your point, that's how we got to, we're now doing technology subscriptions because we got feedback for people they loved our technology and they wanted to license it. We got feedback from people that they couldn't afford to buy the products from us. So we decided to do financing for them. We got feedback that they wanted more visibility. So we built 
technology that gives them more visibility. And to me, that's the way to build a sustainable business, right? You build right. a sustainable business by building in a feedback loop with customer interaction and customer feedback and customer discovery. And you actually talk to your customers. What a novel idea. Pick up the phone and talk to your customers. Like, come on, right? Speak to your customers and ask them how it's going and what do they need and how you can support them and how you can make their life better. And then you iterate and iterate and iterate. That's how you get there, right? It's not because you wake up in the morning and you say, I want to build the most eco-friendly, most sustainable, amazing thing ever. That's not how it happens. Unless you've got the financing and the and some technology to do that right out of the gate, but there aren't that many, you know, which is, which is, which. listen, you've been really generous with your time and I know we're, we're running a little long, so I want to be respectful of that. Uh, what's next? What's next for send one, two, three. We've got some, we got some big audacious plans. So, um, you know, I, I think that's shocked you do. <laughs> um, you know, I think you want to set aggressive and attainable goals and that's what we've done. And, you know, we're, our goals are to continuing, uh, you know, we like to double our revenue this year and then double again next year and just keep on doubling and doubling uh, for the next uh, few years. Um, you know, that's that's what our goals are. You know, we, um, our headcount, uh, we tripled our headcount last year and we'd like to double it again within the next year and keep doubling, doubling, tripling the revenue. Uh, our hands are full. So, I mean, you know, with our three product offerings, like we're not coming out with a new product offering in the next foreseeable future. We just want to perfect what we've got and iterate on what we have. Um, yeah, that's 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 what we're focused on right now. That's awesome. Now, two two last questions. I always ask guess everybody these. They're sort of a little bit of personal reflection. What's uh, one personal quality that you most had to overcome in order to succeed? Oh, I'm very impatient. I mean, I want, and I, and we talked about social media. We talked about like these TV shows. It breeds impatience right now. I think social media is bred impatience amongst all of us. So I want everything now, now, now. And as does society wants everything now. So I've had to learn um, roadmap. I'd have to learn, you know, put it on the roadmap and put it on the timeline and wait for that roadmap to to achieve itself. And my team, I, I, I know I always tell my team I want it faster. I want it now. And, uh, you know, I don't even have to say it anymore. I just say, you know what I'm going to say? And they already know what I'm going to say. So, yeah, so that's something I struggle with, but I'm working on it. I try to have compassion for everybody around me with that, knowing that I have that. So that's something I'm working on. And what's one quality that most contributed to your success? I naively believe I can change the world and that I can achieve, I can achieve the goals. I can like, like if, you know, like I believe that believe I would call that, I would call that quality confidence. Yeah. Like I, I believe that I could take on the fortune 500s and change the world. I believe I can do that. And so I do. Nice. So how can people find you? Uh, send one, two, three.com. It's the best place to find us. Reach out to us. You can find us on all the socials, but I don't go there anymore, as I mentioned. So, right. But you can find us on the socials. Uh, Jeff Golfman on LinkedIn. I go there, you know, maybe once a month and check my messages. Uh, yeah. So, Jeff Golfman on LinkedIn, send123.com. Best place to find us. Awesome. Thanks so much for your time. It's been a fun conversation. Thank you, Warren. I really appreciate it. <laughs>